Welcome back, everyone. It's lecture four. Today we're going to talk about structure of viruses, how different virus particles are built, uh, and what are the principles that govern these, govern these structures. So the virus particles are made up of what we call structural proteins. That's, that's a very specific definition. There are many proteins made in virus-infected cells, but they don't end up in virus particles. So they're not structural proteins. And these are some of the functions of these structural proteins. First, they have to protect the genome. You know, in a virus, all that matters is the genome. These beautiful particles, you know, enveloped or icosahedral, as you'll see, they're beautiful, but they're just to protect the genome. All that matters is the genome uh, that has to go from cell to cell or organism to organism. And here are some of the ways uh, they, they are involved in protecting the genome. They help assemble a stable shell. And we're going to talk about today why it's so stable. Uh, they also, the, the structural proteins have to recognize and package the nucleic acid genome. Packaging is a specific process that we talk about, which means when you build a particle, you make sure that only the viral genome gets in, nothing else in the cell. You don't want cellular nucleic acids in the particle. That would dilute your infectivity. And finally, uh, the structural proteins have to interact with host cell membranes, and that gives you an envelope. For those viruses that are enveloped, the structural proteins drive the formation of an envelope, as we'll see later in this course. The structural proteins also have to deliver the genome. All right, so they have to make sure that the virus particle is stable as it goes from cell to cell within you or an organism and from person to person, right, in, in aerosols or droplets or feces or whatever, the way the, the particles are transmitted, they're stable. But then they have to become unstable, and this is a very specific process we'll talk about today. They have to deliver the genome into the cell. If they can't deliver it, it will never reproduce. So these structural proteins have to bind host cell receptors. They have to help uncoat the genome, and we'll talk about that next time, the mechanisms. Uh, the, the viruses with envelopes, their membranes have to fuse with host cell membranes. And then finally, once the genome is in the cell, it has to go to the right place. So some genomes are in the cytosol, that's fine, but others have to get into the nucleus, for example. Now, before we go any further, we have to make some definitions, of course, because I will say terms that you don't know, you've never heard of before. So here they are in terms of structure. First, subunit. I will say subunit, and what I mean is a single folded, folded polypeptide chain. So here is, is are three single folded polypeptide chains, and the nomenclature is typical. VP virion protein 1, 2, and 3, for example. And each of these are a single polypeptide that go to build the virus particle. So that's what a subunit is. And then the next level up is called a structural unit, which has synonyms, including protomer and asymmetric unit. This is the unit from which the, the virus particles, which are called capsids, or even nucleocapsids, are built. And we have to define these in a moment. Um, so uh, it can, can, be, it can compose of, be composed of one subunit. So a structural unit can be just one subunit repeated many times, or it could be multiple. In this case, this virus outlined in black, there are three subunits making up the, su the structural unit, which is black here. But sometimes it can be just one subunit. And then we have capsid, which is from Latin meaning box. It is the protein shell surrounding the genome. So many viruses have capsids like this one. SARS-CoV-2 does not. It's an envelope virus. It has a nucleocapsid, which we'll define in a moment. But many viruses are just naked protein shells, such as this one. And then we have envelope, which, of, of course, is the viral membrane. Uh, that is derived always from the host cell, and it is a lipid bilayer. And, of course, it's, it's, uh, in it are embedded viral glycoproteins, which we will talk about. And so envelopes can be on both viruses with uh, capsids, like the one on the upper right, or they can be around um, vi on viruses that have a um, nucleocapsid or just nucleic acid inside without any higher-order structure such as that. And we'll get into this more today. And then we have the nucleocapsid. 
or the core of the particle. This is the nucleic acid protein assembly within the particle. And this is, this is always confusing. Every year that I've taught this course, people get confused about it. It's used when there's a discrete substructure. So here we have influenza virus, which is enveloped and has eight RNA protein complexes in it. And that's called the nucleocapsid. The RNA protein complex is the nucleocapsid. It's a substructure of the particle. And here on the right is herpes simplex virus. And here we have a capsid, which is inside an envelope. So that's actually a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. Whereas up on the top right here is poliovirus. We don't call this a nucleocapsid. It's a capsid because there's no envelope around it. If you put an envelope around this virus, then that would be the nucleocapsid. And there are some viruses that are built that way. But it's, you have to think about substructure. And that's what makes it a nucleocapsid. So a little bit about dimensions here because I will use dimensions of all sorts because we're dealing with very small particles and we can't talk about meters, right? <laughs> because, you know, 10 angstroms, um, which is a good scale for virus particles, is 10 to the minus 9 meters. So I'm not going to talk about meters, obviously. We will talk about angstroms, uh, which is also equivalent to 0 0.001 microns. And just to give you some references for these numbers, the alpha helix in a protein, uh, is, which is over here, is about a nanometer in diameter. DNA, which is shown here, double-stranded DNA, is about two nanometers in diameter. And uh, a ribosome is 20 nanometers. Poliovirus is 30 nanometers. And, of course, the big giant viruses are bigger, 1,000 nanometers or a micron. Okay. Putting particles into perspectives. Now, uh, virus particles are metastable. This is a very important concept. They have to protect the genome, as I've said, as it travels from cell to cell or host to host. But in the cell, they have to come apart. So they have a stable phase and they have an unstable phase. That's called metastability. It's very straightforward. How you control it may not be so straightforward. But here's an example of a virus particle. Outside the cell is very stable, but it binds a receptor, and that is actually for this virus the trigger that dissociates it and allows it to release the RNA. The trigger or the signal to go from stable to unstable varies according to the kind of virus, and we'll talk about that more in detail next time. But for today, you need to just understand that virus particles are metastable because they can exist in either stable or unstable states. And a little more definition of what we mean by metastability. Virus particles have not attained a minimum free energy conformation in order to be unstable. So they exist in a high energy state. And in order to get to the free energy, minimum free energy conformation, they have to surmount an unfavorable energy barrier. So viruses exist. And here's, here's a, a graph of different states of the virus particle with, with free energy, G, on the y-axis, all right? And so virus particles, in order to become unstable, to the, release the genome, they have to get down here in state three, which is the minimum free energy conformation. And they exist in state one, which is a higher energy. But to get to three, they have to go over a barrier, a higher, an even higher energy state. Uh, and they do that because they're spring-loaded during assembly. They contain energy built into the bonds that make them up. So we say energy is put in the particle during assembly, they're spring-loaded, and that energy is used for disassembly if the particle gets the right signal. And so the energy is used to surmount this energy barrier and go to the minimum free energy state. The signal can be binding to a receptor, it can be low pH, it can be proteases that cleave structural proteins. So the virus particles ensure that they infect the right cell by having these signals make them unstable. So how do we become metastable? How do we make a particle that is very stable under some conditions and unstable under others? Uh, so here, here are the two ways. We can make a stable structure by symmetrical arrangement of many identical proteins in a particle to provide maximal contact between those proteins, and that gives you stability. These are, in general, not covalent bonds. They're non-covalent bonds, but the protein-protein interfaces are extensive, and so the non-covalent forces can end up 
giving a great deal of stability to the particle. So here you have an example in the upper right of a virus particle built up of repeating subunits of three proteins, VP1, 2, and 3. And the symmetrical arrangement gives you lots of contact between the proteins and stability. And the unstable part comes first because they're not covalently bound together. The protein subunits are not covalently bound, and therefore they can be taken apart or loosened to release or expose the genomes. Now, in many cases, the virus particle comes apart and the genome is released, but you'll see as we go through this course, there are many viruses where the genome actually stays in the particle and, and the polymerization occurs there. But that particle does have to be loosened to allow access, to allow things to get in and nucleic acids to get out. First question is, viral capsids are metastable because they must protect the viral genome outside of the cell. They must come apart and release the genome in a cell. They have not obtained a minimum free energy confirmation. They are spring-loaded, all of the above. All right, let's have a look at how we did here. 96% of you got all of the above, which is the right answer. All of these are right. So if you picked any individual one, you were right, but they're all correct. So you had to pick them all. Now, we can solve structures of virus particles, and you're going to see lots of examples of that throughout this course. And we've gotten really good at it, as I'll show you today. Within a month of isolating SARS-CoV-2, we had the structure of the glycoprotein. Amazing. Amazing. And let's talk about the tools. How do we do this? So electron microscopy, of course, is one tool that you can use to look at a virus particle and see what it looks like. Uh, you can use X-ray crystallography. You grow crystals of the virus, bombard it with electrons. Uh, and you can use cryo-electron microscopy or cryo-electron tomography. These are methods where you freeze the particles in water to give them contrast, and then you take pictures of them. And then you can use nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to solve structures of, of smaller proteins. You can't solve a whole virus particle. It's too big for that. But you can do smaller proteins. Uh, and here, here's an electron microscope, of course. Uh, it was I, w I visited Cornell up in Ithaca a couple of years ago, and uh, th these are always amazing, right? They're incredible structures and uh, instruments have to be kept very cold, and they, they shoot electrons through the specimen. And so the, the resolution is very high. Lots of wires and amazing technology. Remember, these, the era of modern structural biology begins in 1940 when Helmuth Ruska, uh, he had invented the electron microscope, right? And he took pictures of virus particles. I've shown you this before. These are bacteriophages attached to an E. coli for the first time showing that viruses were particulate. Right? Before this, we thought they were liquids. And here's the paper. Uh, that was published, looking at that. And that was the beginning. Now, a little bit about electron microscopy. It's contributed a lot to structural virology, and we still use it. But the problem with electron microscopy is that biological materials have very little contrast, and you need to stain them. Of course, if you're looking at, say, tissue sections in a light microscope, you typically stain them to, say, show contrast between the nuclei and the cytosol and so forth. But the dyes you use to stain those sections, you can't use in electron microscopy because they're too big. They wouldn't tell you anything. So we have to do something different for viruses, and we use what's called negative staining. And we use an electron-dense material. So remember, we're not putting light through the virus particles, as you would for a light microscope. We're putting electrons, way greater resolution. But we need to be able to stain with something. And in this case, we put... a, a a stain that the electrons bounce off of. That's what's meant by electron dense. And here's, these are two chemicals we use, uranyl acetate or phosphotungstate. We mix the virus particles with these, and they will coat it, and they will scatter electrons. This was figured out in 1959. Unfortunately, the resolution is not great in electron microscopy, it's only about 50 to 75 angstroms. And you think about the, the, the alpha helix being, you know, 10 angstroms in diameter, it's not very good. But on the bottom here are some electron micrographs of different virus particles here. And you can see 
overall structure, right? You can see that here is an icosahedral particle with some fibers sticking out from uh, each, each corner, and that, that's an adenovirus. And here's a hepatitis B virus, which exists in different forms. And here's an influenza virus, an envelope virus. And on the right is a picornavirus, where you can see some of them are empty uh, and some of them are not. But you don't get any detailed structural interpretation. Nevertheless, we do use this, and it was used initially on samples of the first SARS-CoV-2. And you could see it looked like a coronavirus. You can tell that much. All right, so we use X-ray crystallography for high-resolution structures of viruses. And what you do is you have to grow a crystal, which means you purify your virus. Here you grow, you grow a lot of poliovirus, and you figure out some condition where it makes crystals. And what I mean by crystals, yeah, you, you look at your salt, right? Those are crystals. You make big crystals of viruses, and that's not easy to do. It's like black magic, hit or miss. And then you put them in an X-ray beam, and you hope that they don't dissolve immediately. <laughs> you know, after spending a year maybe making the crystals, you hope that they diffract. In other words, the, the X-ray will hit the crystal and all the atoms in the crystal, which are arrayed in regular arrays, right? All the virus particles are arrayed. The X-rays will hit the atoms and diffract or bounce off in a way that's characteristic of the structure. And you, in the old days, you used to put a piece of film at the other end of this line here and, and look at the diffraction pattern. If you know anything about the history of biology, remember the famous X-ray that Rosalind Franklin took of DNA. It looked just like that. And Watson and Crick took it off her desk and they used it to solve the structure. But she had made the picture. Uh, nowadays, we don't take pictures anymore. We have a, a sensor, a detector attached to a computer that collects the data. And we, all these dots tell you where the atoms are uh, in, in the structure of the virus. So that's X-ray crystallography. And it, as it said on the slide, you can get resolutions of two to three angstroms, which is great. You can see all the uh, amino acid chains, and you can see the side chains as well. It's just remarkable, but it's hard to do. Another technology, cryoelectron microscopy. It depends on freezing the sample. And that's why it's cryo, low temperatures, and you usually do it in liquid nitrogen. And you have water, or an aque I'll say an aqueous solution, and that gives a little bit of contrast to the particles, so you can take a picture. And this, this is an example of it here. And this whole, this whole way of doing this uh, was awarded Nobel Prizes in, in 2017 to these three individuals, uh, Dubochet, Frank, and Henderson. And they developed the technology for, stain, for freezing an aqueous or vitreous water, for taking the pictures, and for using computational approaches to um, solve the structure. And, and Frank, of course, is uh, up at the Columbia Medical Center. Now, what you do is you, you put your particles on uh, in water, you freeze it, and then you take pictures of the particles. And the idea is that every particle is oriented in a different three-dimensional space. It's kind of like doing a CAT scan, right, where the X-ray machine goes around the patient, and then you assemble all the views to get a three-dimensional structure, a structure of the patient. Here we take pictures, maybe hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and then you use a computer to analyze all of them and do Fourier transforms uh, to to transform them, transform the pictures into data, and then you reverse it or do an inverse Fourier to get the 3D reconstruction. So this bit in the middle here is basically saying take all those pictures and assemble them into a three-dimensional image. And you can make images of particles, and now you can do, uh, you can do um, images of big proteins as well. It doesn't work as well for small proteins, but it works uh, well for big proteins and virus particles. And so as some examples, here is a poliovirus. On the, on the left is the X-ray crystal structure at 2.9 angstroms. And you can see every atom in this structure. And what you do is you take the coordinates, X, Y, Z coordinates, you can put them in a computer. And there are not lots of programs now that allow you to build models such as this. Uh, and then uh, on the lower right is the cryo-EM structure of the same virus. And that's 20 angstroms, much lower resolution. You can just see the general shape of the particle, but you can see some features. For example, you see, hey, this is a star, isn't it? Yeah, that's called the five-fold axis. There are five copies of a protein arranged around it, and it 
makes it look like a star. Uh, and in the background are the uh, f images of polio virus particles that were used, frozen and photographed to make the 20 angstrom structure. Uh, in 2015, when Zika virus emerged uh, as, a, as a new pathogen, um, immediately, within six months, the virus particle structure was determined, uh, this time by cryo-EM at 3.8 angstrom. So initially, you saw in the previous picture, poliovirus was 20 angstrom. It couldn't compete with, um, cryo with uh, X-ray crystallography, but the technology has been getting better and better, and now they can rival x-ray crystallography in uh, resolution, and it could be done much faster. And so here is the Zika virus at 3.8 resolution. This is an icosahedral particle uh, where you can see repeated proteins in red, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and here in blue, and three proteins, and here in green, two. We're going to talk about what this means in a moment, but here is a vision. That's the whole particle there, and here we've zoomed in, and the, here in the, in, in the big image, the Proteins are shown as an alpha carbon trace. The, the upper left image is a space-filling model where we make all the atom spheres, and this is an alpha carbon tracing, and we've colored the different proteins different colors. But you can see the repeating nature of it, and I love these. I, I have programs that can display these images, and I mean, you can go through the particle, you can zoom in, you can do all kinds of amazing things, and of course, you can highlight residues that you think are important. Now, remember last year, 2020, SARS-CoV-2 was isolated in uh, January from a patient in Wuhan. And by February, the structure of the spike protein was already solved by cryo-electron microscopy. Amazing. Here's the particle, of course, and the spike is embedded in the membrane. It is a trimer of three monomers, and here's the monomer structure. And we'll look at this uh, often in this course. Um, and, and you can see it is at the bottom here is the part where it's embedded into the viral membrane. At the top right, this green part is the receptor binding domain. That's the part that, that binds ACE2. And there are other parts of this that are essential for entry, as we'll talk about uh, next time. That's really remarkable that it was done so quickly. And since then, many more structures have been solved um, with uh, antibodies bound to the spike, uh, with receptor bound to the spike. It's really unprecedented, the amount of information that's come out so quickly. Here's another model of the SARS-CoV-2 particle. Uh, this one is actually on the cover of uh, Principles of Virology. It's made by a company um, called Visual Science. And they took this, the three-dimensional structure of the spike, which is the red protein here, and then they, uh, it, they made a model of the RNA inside the particle, with the nucleocapsid protein bound to it. And then they modeled the membrane, of course. And you can see they've, they've cut a hole in one side. So you can, you can see it. So the story of this is interesting. We had contracted visual science to make the covers for volumes one and two of the book. And they were both going to be HIV. And then um, I, I heard that they were making this. Actually, the, the guys in the company sent me this model. And they said, uh, tell us what you think of this. And I said, I think I want to have this on the cover and not HIV. So they substituted. So this is on volume two. Anyway, so that that's amazing. Now, the you can do structures of big, giant viruses. And this is one called Cafeteria Roenbergensis virus. It's a virus that infects this flagellated protist that lives in the ocean. Uh, there's tons of these in the ocean and tons of this virus. And the, the guy who... Um, let me stop it so I can see the credit here. No. The guy who did this... Chun Shao at uh, um, University of Texas El Paso. You can you can see more of his structures there. Um, it took him years to do this. This is a 300 nanometer particle with over 15,000 capsid proteins. And look, he, he got the structure. It took three million CPU hours to solve this. You know, once he got the data, the computer. And he said this movie used to crash his computer because you're rolling right this virus on the ocean, and just, you have to roll every atom. <laughs> it's a lot of computing power. Anyway, so you can do a lot with structural biology tools. I mean, they're all beautiful pictures, but we're going to actually use them to make uh, inferences and conclusions about uh, how virus particles work. Now, you learned a few lectures ago that there are seven 
kinds of viral genomes, right? And by now you know them all. They're easy to remember. And it turns out there are three different kinds of virus particles. And so what you have to do is remember the subway signs, seven and three. What are the three? We have helical, icosahedral, and complex. That's the three different kinds of ways that virus particles are built. It's all you have to know. Um, and we're going to go through what these are in a moment, but you can see they're strikingly different. The complex ones include the big viruses, the giant viruses where they're assembled in, with principles that we don't understand. They're not really symmetrical at all, as are the helical and icosahedral uh, ways of assembling particles. Now, symmetry for those first two types of particle is the key for the helical and the icosahedral. And this was actually... Uh, discovered by Watson and Crick, who you know uh, published the structure of DNA, taking Rosalind Franklin's X-ray, of course, and, and for which they got the Nobel Prize. Uh, but they also made an incredible contribution to structural virology. And here's how, how it goes. They noticed, they published a paper saying most virus particles, now remember this is in the 60s, where we don't know a lot of viruses and we have very few pictures of them, but said that we noticed that most of them are either spherical or rod-shaped, rod-shaped like tobacco mosaic virus or spherical bacteriophage heads and so forth. So they had this idea. They said, because virus genomes are small, and I put an exclamation mark there because now we know they're not small anymore, um, we said, well, they're small genomes, so the proteins can't be very big that make up these particles. So they have to be a, one or a couple of proteins repeated many times, which we call genetic economy. And we know for the giant viruses that's not true anymore. But the giant viruses don't have this kind of symmetry, so it still makes sense in a way. And they said, here's how it works. They're, for viruses uh, with rod shapes, like tobacco mosaic virus, they said the proteins are distributed with what they called helical symmetry. And for the round viruses, icosahedral symmetry. Those are the two types of symmetry that they thought virus particles were built with, and that's pretty much held up, and I want to go through that. Uh, with you now. There are two rules in symmetry. And the two rules, remember them, they provide rules for self-assembly of particles because, in fact, that's what the particles do. You make the subunits in an infected cell and they will self-assemble into a virus particle, right? So rule one, each subunit has identical, in quotes, bonding contacts with its neighbors. Turns out it's, it's not quite identical after you get to a certain size particle, and, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. But in the initial uh, iteration of these ideas, these symmetry rules, they thought they would be identical. And that's because you have repeated interactions of chemically complementary surfaces on the proteins, right? They interact with each other at their interfaces, and that gives you a symmetrical arrangement, which you could see in this diagram of icosahedral particle. You have uh, a few subunits repeated over and over again. So that's rule one, identical binding context. And rule two, they're non-covalent interactions. So they are reversible. If you make a mistake assembling them, you can reverse it. And of course, you can take them apart when the virus gets into a cell to get rid to get to release the nucleic acid. So those are the symmetry rules. And inherent in these rules is the is the fact that if you make these proteins, they will self-assemble because they fold and they interact with each other. And we have taken advantage of that. So ma many capsid proteins self-assemble into what we call virus-like particles, or VLPs. We call them that because they don't have nucleic acid in them. Okay, and um, vaccines, we take advantage of this to make vaccines. For example, the... Uh, human uh, HP, HBV, um, hepatitis B virus, and the human papillomavirus vaccines. These are virus-like particles made in yeast, produce one viral protein, and it assembles into a capsid. And so here's the HPV vaccine. You synthesize the one protein that makes up the capsid. It assembles into a pentamer first, five copies, and then the pentamers form an empty particle. And they do this on their own. It's remarkable. And we make vaccines out of this, and they work very well. These are two very good vaccines. So the symmetry and self-assembly, we have taken advantage of to make vaccines. All right, so first, helical symmetry. 
and someone asks, um, does this idea of symmetrical arrangement correspond with PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns in the innate immune sensing? No, it's different. You know, these PAMPs are typically protein or double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA or DNA, et cetera, and they don't have these uh, symmetrical structures. That's not a requirement for sensing. First, helical symmetry. And we've met this virus. It's tobacco mosaic virus. It's an example of a virus constructed with helical symmetry. In fact, there's an electron micrograph of TMV, the rod-shaped particles. And here is a... Um, actually, this is a computer image built from the three-dimensional structure of the particle. And what this virus is made up of, a single coat protein here, shown in yellow, this um, yellow subunit here, a subunit, of course, and they engage in identical equivalent interactions with one another and with the viral genome. So the viral genome here is in green. It's a plus RNA. And the genome interacts with the subunit, and the subunits interact with each other. So there are two kinds of interaction here, protein-protein and protein-RNA interactions. And this gives you a helix. Right, The RNA is coiled around with the protein attached to it, and the helix has a certain diameter and a certain turn length and so forth. But you basically can make this very stable structure from one protein, repeated many times, and it's stable and it protects the RNA. Now, this is a plant virus, and um, it, it, this virus typically travels from plant to plant by you know, farmers content with contaminated machinery or insects or nematodes going from plant to plant. They are mechanically transmitted. There are animal viruses with uh, helical symmetry, but they're never naked like this. So this would be called the capsid of the virus. Animal viruses have the same kind of structure, but they're usually enveloped. So here's an example of an animal virus called Sendai virus. And yes, it was first isolated in Japan. It is a paramyxovirus, and this is a virus family that contains measles virus, etc., cetera, uh, mumps virus and others. And it is a helical symmetry. It's got the RNA there. It's a negative strand RNA in this case, a single protein called NP nuclear protein which interact with each other and which the RNA make, in this case, 1,000 nanometer long uh, nuclear capsid. But in these viruses that infect uh, animals, the nuclear capsids are always enveloped. That's why we call them a nuclear capsid because they're a substructure and the TMV was just a capsid. So here's the nuclear capsid of the paramyxovirus and here's an EM of the virus particle. And this, this one is broken. So the nuclear capsid is actually spilling out but normally it would be contained in there. You can see it's got that rod-like structure. And for some reason, in animal viruses that have helical symmetry, they're always enveloped. So we always call them a nuclear capsid because they're a substructure within an envelope. So again, nuclear capsid. <laughs> a nuclear capsid is what we call uh, this kind of a structure when it's a substructure. So here in measles virus, it's a nuclear capsid because it's within an envelope. Here, it's a capsid because in tobacco mosaic virus, it is naked. It's not a substructure. And someone says, looks like the RNA is unprotected. Well, I think that's artistic license. You're showing it so you can see it, but it's well protected at either end. It doesn't get digested. So another animal virus with helical symmetry is called vesicular stomatitis virus. And this is a rhabdovirus, so it's related to rabies virus, but this is a virus that infects cows mostly. And um, we have used it as a vector to make vaccines. Uh, the Ebola virus vaccine is um, uh, made with vesicular stomatitis virus vector. Merck today just announced its VSV vectored SARS-CoV-2 vaccine failed in phase one, and they're discontinuing it, sadly. But anyway... This has a nuclear capsid. It's an RNA bound to a single protein nuclear capsid protein wound up around itself in this helical symmetry. And here is a structure of the RNA bound to 10 molecules of RNA. You can see blue, red, blue, red, etc. There's the RNA in green. There's a single uh, nuclear capsid protein 
it's a bilobed protein with a groove in the middle and the RNA fits into the groove. So this binds very nicely to the protein. The proteins interact with each other. And this is the actual cryo-EM structure of the nucleocapsid. This is the data, the EM data that were used uh, to, to make this. And this is an unusual virus because one end is a tip, looks like a bullet. The middle is the trunk and the end is the base, which is flat. And the, the nRNA complex winds around for all this. And at the very end, it, it does some weird things to make it a closed end. And then there's another protein on top of it, the M protein, and then the envelope. So that's helical symmetry. And here's some examples of envelope viruses with negative single-stranded RNA genomes and helical capsids. And in these cases, they're nucleocapsids because they're substructures, right? So here, the paramyxoviruses, which I've shown you, measles virus, envelope virus with an RNA protein nucleocapsid because it's in a membrane. Rabies or rhabdoviruses, again, I've shown you in a helical nucleocapsid envelope. Influenza viruses have helical nucleocapsids. Theirs happen to be in eight segments. There are eight pieces of RNA protein complexes. And here's a, a higher magnification view of what one of them looks like. The RNA is shown here in green, and it's bound to nu nucleocapsid protein NP and also three other proteins at one end that constitute the RNA polymerase. So... Uh, this in the particle is a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. And then the filoviruses like Ebola viruses, again, they are negative RNA bound to a nucleocapsid protein. In this case, they're very long and the particle is filamentous, but it is a nucleocapsid because it's, on, it's within an envelope as a substructure. So the nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly that's packaged within the virus particle. <clears throat> now, someone asked, are there chaperones? Involved, Yes, we will talk about those uh, when we talk about virus particle assembly. Now, there are some envelope viruses with plus single-stranded RNA and helical capsids. And one of them are the coronaviruses, uh, which include SARS-CoV-1, the, the original one in 2003, MERS coronavirus. And, oh, look, I have the old name here. These are all enveloped. They have plus-stranded genomes and they have helical capsids. This RNA protein complex is a helix, and it's a nucleocapsid. See? Nucleoprotein plus RNA is a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. If, it were naked, if the virus were just the naked RNA protein, it would just be a capsid, but that wouldn't occur in animal viruses, right? The um, uh, plant viruses are the only ones with naked uh, capsids of RNA proteins in a helix like this. And, and again, the coronavirus is called coronavirus because... When they were first looked at in the EM, someone said, it looks like the solar corona, this fringe of spikes around the envelope. And so they called them coronaviruses. And um, when that first virus was isolated from patients in China, early 2020, they did an EM. They wanted to know, what do we have here? They had done a bronchoalveolar lavage. They took a little of that fluid, put it under an EM, and boom, looks like a coronavirus. Do you know, um, last year, one of, the highest, one of the neighborhoods in New York City with the highest infection in the country was Corona, Queens? You can't make this stuff up, you know? <laughs> there are other DNA and RNA viruses with helical symmetry. There are viruses with double-stranded DNA of archaea. Uh, there are DNA viruses that have... This is flexuous, and, and this is a more rigid... Uh, virus with genomic DNA, but looks very much like tobacco mosaic virus, except this one has uh, tail fibers. Uh, so these infect archaea. Here's single-stranded viruses of bacteria, single-stranded DNA. All these are helical symmetry, rod-like plus and minus viruses of plants. That would include TMV. And then you have flexuous plus RNA viruses. So some of them are rigid, some of them are flexible, but they're all built with helical symmetry. All right. A couple of years ago, I bought some of these buckyballs, and I made a, a helix with them. Now, it's not quite right because it's – if you think that the balls are the protein subunit, right, there's no RNA in here, but it still illustrates the principle. And, you know, I started showing this in my class, and 
students started buying me different colored buckyballs. So now I got all different colors here, and I make really long ones. But you can grab one end and unwind it, and then they will wind back together on their own because they're magnetic, these little very powerful magnets. So you could, you could buy these in different colors and build them. All right, our next question is, which of the following describes virus symmetry and self-assembly? A, the bo bonding contacts of subunits are usually covalent. B, the bonding contacts are usually non-covalent. C, each subunit has different bonding contacts with its neighbors. D, self-assembly of virus particles does not occur. E, none of the above. Someone asks, so the capsids are not a part of the nucleocapsids. So if you're a tobacco mosaic virus, you're a, you're a capsid. You are a helical protein RNA assembly. A nucleocapsid is only when it's a substructure. So if you are a nuclear, nuclear protein plus RNA in a membrane, then that's a nucleocapsid. Can nucleocapsids ever be a substructure of a virus enclosed in something else besides an envelope? So you could have... Do you see how confusing this is? I told you it would be confusing. You can have a genome bound to protein inside of a capsid without an envelope, and that would that genome protein complex could be a nucleocapsid. So it doesn't have to be a membrane. All right, what do we have here? Most of you got B. The bonding contacts are usually non-covalent, so they're they're not usually covalent. Not at all. That's how they come apart. They don't have different bonding contacts. They have, quote, identical, right? Um, Self-assembly does occur. So that's uh, helical symmetry. Now, let's make some spherical virus particles, right? How do you make a round capsid with, from proteins that are not round, right? Proteins are not round. They have all kinds of irregular shapes. So here's poliovirus in the electron micrograph. And here's one of the viral proteins, VP1, that makes up the capsid. It's not spherical. So how do you do this? And again, Watson and Quick led the way on this. Clue one, all round capsids have precise numbers of proteins, and they ha they're typically multiples of 60, but not always. But they're very common, multiples of 60, like 180, 240, 960. But you'll find some that are not, so don't, don't get upset about that. And two, spherical viruses come in many sizes, but the capsid proteins are typically between 20 and 60 kilodaltons in average in size, molecular weight. And so Watson and Crick thought about this a lot. And they decided these spherical viruses are built with icosahedral symmetry. An icosahedron, of course, is one of the platonic solids. There are a couple of others, right? But this one is the only one whose symmetry is used to build virus particles. Now, an icosahedron is a solid with 20 faces. Here, here's a face outlined by this equilateral triangle. It's got 20 of those. And that repeating, that, that face gives you what we call axes of symmetry. Very simple. Well, there are five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. They're 12 each. You can count them up. Five-fold axis is here in green. It simply means there are five copies of the subunit the structural unit around the five-fold axis. Two-fold, there are two copies. Three-fold, there are three. And you can see them here, five-fold, two-fold, and three-fold. It turns out that an icosahedral symmetry allows the formation of a closed shell with the smallest number of identical subunits. You can build the smallest virus particle with 60 copies of the same protein repeated, and no other platonic solid can do that. So this is what we think, why this kind of symmetry has evolved to be um, the way many of these viruses are built, icosahedral symmetry. So there are simple icosahedral capsids. As I said, they're made up of one protein, 60 copies, and that is enough to build a sphere. It's, it's not actually a, an icosahedron, you know, with angles. It's just built with icosahedral symmetry. So, you know, the picture I show you here is an actual icosahedron but virus particles are not icosahedra. They're spheres with this kind of symmetry. The protein subunit is the structural unit. Remember, subunit is the protein chain, and the structural unit is what you build the particle from. And in this case, for these simple capsids, they're the same. 
But as we get bigger, they're not always the same. The structural unit is made up of more than one protein subunit. And in these particles, interactions of all molecules with their neighbors are identical. So we don't need to put identical in quotes for these small particles. They're all identical. They're either head-to-head -head or tail-to-tail. -tail. And in this illustration, uh, you can see you know, five orange commas. The comma is the protein subunit. It's also the structural unit. They're all interacting with each other in the same way, head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail. -tail. There's, by the way, a five-fold axis of symmetry, five copies of the protein around it, two-fold axis in blue, three-fold axis, the red triangle. And just remember, these are spherical. They're not icosahedral, but the way the proteins are arranged follow the rules of icosahedral symmetry. So an example of these simple viruses is a parvovirus. Now, parvoviruses include viruses that makes your dog and cats sick, and you need to vaccinate them against those infections. Otherwise, they'll die, and um, or they may die. Um, a, a parvovirus is an example of a, a human virus. is adeno-associated virus in here, serotype 2. These are very important viruses. We use these for gene therapy. We're going to talk about these later. But these are small particles, 25 nanometers. They're made of 60 copies of a single capsid protein. They happen to contain small single-stranded DNA genome. Very, very interesting, and we'll talk about this. So here's the single capsid protein. Five of them come together to form a pentamer, and then, of course, a dozen pentamers make up the virus particle. They're made up of one protein. So the protein is the same as the structural unit. Here's the protein right here, and you put 60 of those together, you get this beautiful capsid with five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry, five copies, three copies, and two copies of the capsid protein uh, around those axes. How do you make a bigger virus particle? You don't make this, the proteins bigger. You add more of them. That's it. You add more subunits. Now, when you do that, you get slightly different interactions on the particle. Nothing, not all are now identical. That's why we have quotes around the identical in that slide. We now have pentamers and hexamers because we have different modes of subunit packing. So here, for example, there's a five-fold axis of symmetry. There are five copies of this structural protein around it. Uh, but you can see around the three-fold axis, we have six copies of this particular protein around it. So this is a pentamer and this is a hexamer. That's what happens when you add more subunits. You break that original icosahedral symmetry, so now you have slightly different interactions. You still have head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail, -tail, but because you have some areas where there are five subunits and sub some areas where there are six, by definition, the interactions are no longer identical. We call them quasi-equivalent. The structural biologists learned this as they were studying how viruses were built, and they say, ah, you know, the, the rules aren't quite what Watson and Crick said, but we can call them quasi-equivalent because they're similar. And so this is a virus built uh, with 180 identical protein subunits, right? So the first one was 60, now 180. It's a bigger particle. So quasi-equivalence is this idea that if a capsid has more than 60 subunits, each one of those occupies a quasi-equivalent position in the particle. And, and in addition, the non-covalent binding properties in these environments, they're similar but not identical. So again, you have these hexamers and pentamers. It's all head-to-head. -head, it's all tail-to-tail. -tail, but, you know, they're environments that are clearly different. That's all that means. Now, the other aspect of, of icosahedral symmetry that I want to tell you about is what's called the T or the triangulation number. And this is actually defined mathematically, but I want to give you a simple definition, which is visual on this slide. And the T number is the number of protein subunits per face of the icosahedron or the equilateral triangle, right? So here is the simplest uh, icosahedron. There's one of the uh, uh, equilateral triangles that make it up. And so this is a virus with T equals one triangulation number, one protein per, equal, per uh, triangular face. <clears throat> and you can actually multiply T times 60 to get the total number of subunits in the particle. And here's, for example, a T equals three particle. You have uh, three protein subunits per face. One, two, three. And so t three times 60 gives you 180. It's the next biggest particle. You can go up to four. T equals four. T equals 13. And bigger and bigger and bigger. 
All right, so that's the triangulation number. It just describes the number of subunits per equilateral triangle on the icosahedron. And remember, anything with greater than t equals one, you get five and sixfold axes of symmetry, or pentamers and hexamers, we should say. The smallest ones have equivalent interactions with just pentamers, but as soon as you add more, t equals three or higher, you get pentamers and hexamers. Now, a couple of years ago, I visited... Um, University of Illinois in, um, I'm, I don't even remember the name of it. It was somewhere in Indiana. Sorry, <laughs> I can't remember. But I visited a chemist and he had on, these she on his shelf icosahedra made with magnets, made with buckyballs. I didn't know you could do that. So he taught me how to do it. And then I brought them home and I made um, T equals one particles. And this actually beautifully illustrates the symmetry. Look, so we have 60 of identical subunits. And I've arranged them in color. You can see each pentamer in a different color there. And building this really illustrates this nicely. And then I made a T equals three, where you have 180 subunits. And now uh, you can see there are pentamers, five red ones, and then six blue ones, hexamers. It's the only way it will work to put this together is to have pentamers and hexamers. I tell you, I had a, just a great time. And I made a video building this. And I actually have bought more of these so I can make a bigger one. I haven't done it yet, though. I'm so ex I was so excited that I could make both helical uh, and uh, icosahedral particles. Now, an example of these larger particles is poliovirus. It's a 30 nanometer particle uh, made up of 60 uh, subunits, uh, 60 structural units composed of VP1, 2, and 3. That gives you 180. It's uh, you know it's that it's T equals three. It's actually pseudo T equals three because each protein is different is a different protein it's not the same protein 180 times which would be t equals three pseudo t equals three but it doesn't matter uh, anyway here are the three different proteins that's the structural unit and of course uh, five of those are, go around the five-fold axis of symmetry and generate the five-fold axis here's a, the space filling view of the particle uh, and here's the structural unit colored showing you how it fits into the overall icosahedral structure. So really very straightforward um, packing interactions. Getting even bigger, SV40 is a polyomavirus, 50 nanometers, and this one consists of 72 pentamers of VP1, giving you 360 subunits. And this one is quite interesting. Here's the virus particle. Its structure has been solved. So you have uh, again, pentamers with six neighbors and pentamers with five neighbors. It's a little confusing because the basic subunit is VP1 and a pentamer of VP1, five copies of VP1, which is shown right here, blue, green, yellow, red, purple. And then those are used to build the particle, and each of these um, round areas is a pentamer. But sometimes the pentamer has five neighbors, like the purple one here, one, two, three, four, five. And sometimes it has six neighbors, like this one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is exactly what you would predict for bigger than a T equals one. All right. And so uh, that's how this is built. But what's really cool about this one is that these pentamers are locked together by the N termini and the C termini of the VP1 subunit. So you can see here the N terminal extensions of VP1 are engaging VP1 of the neighboring pentamer. See this purple uh, magenta actually is going into the yellow pentamer. It's doing, forming non-covalent bonds, of course, and that holds it together. It gives the particle great stability. So it's an exa another example of how you can build very stable particles. And these, these viruses, by the way, have double-stranded DNA in them, a circle, and it's actually chromatinized. It's wrapped around histones. And one of the very few viruses we know that that is, its DNA is, is ordered in this way. Most of them are just DNA or DNA protein, but not chromatinized. Here's a, here's a close-up that I made uh, of SV40 to show you. So and we have one VP1 pentamer with each subunit colored differently, and then all the others are just blue. But you can see how this yellow N-terminus is insinuating into the neighboring blue pentamer, right? And the red one, the N-terminus is going there. It's just locking them together, non-covalent bonds. That's what gives this great stability. All right, our next question is, which of the following are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry and viral capsids? Produces a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. 
allows formation of a closed shell with 60 identical subunits, five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. The T number describes the number of subunits per icosahedral face or all of the above. Someone asked, is the histone presence the reason why SV40 has its own helicase? No, the helicase is participating in DNA replication to unwind the, uh, the two strands of DNA. And we will actually talk about that uh, later. And someone asked, can I clarify the three modes of subunit packing? Let me, let me go back to the picture to, to do that. Which figure was that? So here, there, there are two modes. There's five pentamers and hexamers, right? Those are the two modes of subunit packing. And that's, that's in contrast to the simple capses where there's just one kind of interaction. Pentamers, head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail. In a, anything bigger than a T equals three, you have uh, areas with five subunits and areas with six. Those are the two different kinds of uh, interactions. Let's see what we did here. 82% of you got E, which is all the above. They're all right. Everything here. It's a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle. Nobody picked that. <laughs> well, of course, because it's every, all the above. But that's correct. A closed shell with 60 subunits is correct. Five, three, and two-fold axes is correct. The T describes the number of subunits, all the above. All right, even bigger and more complicated capsids can be built. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Here's adenovirus, uh, where the electron micrograph shows you this icosahedral capsid with, with fibers sticking out at each five-fold axis of symmetry. So that's something different. It's 150 nanometers. It's a T equals 25 capsid made up of 720 proteins of a viral protein called protein 2, uh, which are assembled in trimers to form what's called a hexon, and then those make up the, the icosahedral shell. But at each of the 12 fivefold axis, there's a fiber, shown here in green. And here's the fiber protein here on the right. It consists of a knob, a shaft, and a penton base that's inserted in there. So that's unusual. We haven't seen that before. Uh, but then there are other proteins with specialized roles. And if you look at the virus particle here, uh, in addition to the hexon and the penton base and the fiber, there are a lot of other proteins here with different roles. And the one I want to point out is nine, which we call cement. It helps stabilize the particle because these penton-hexon mismatches are weak. They're not great. They're, they're not perfect. So you have a, another protein here, protein nine. You can see here these little brown guys stuck in between the hexons to help glue them together, if you will. Uh, sometimes we have two icosahedral shells. And these are real viruses, which are T equals 13 particles 70 to 90 nanometers in diameter. They have two concentric icosahedral shells, which are diagrammed here in purple and in brown. Inside is a double-stranded RNA segmented genome. And here are the structures of the two shells. The outer shell is made up of trimers of VP7, T equals 13. And within it is a shell with a different T number, interestingly. T equals 2, made of VP1 monomers. And... They're, they're compatible with each other. And you may ask, why do you need two shells? And we'll find out next time, actually. But it turns out that the, uh, when this virus gets into a cell, the outer shell is removed and the RNA stays within the inner shell. But removing the outer shell allows access to uh, material to get in and out of the, the capsid. And so the outer shell is protective, basically. The bacteriophages are great examples of uh, putting different symmetries together to make a complicated virus. So here's, uh, these structures have been solved by cryo-EM. Here is a tailed bacteriophage where the head that contains the DNA is built with icosahedral symmetry. Uh, it is, here is a close-up view of it. You can see there are two different packing arrangements, five and six-fold packing arrangements, as you would predict for a big uh, capsid. But then the, the, the head is joined to the tail, which is built with helical symmetry. As you can see, it's coiled up here. And then there's a base plate uh, made up of a number of proteins, which is shown enlarged here. And then there are these tail fibers, which again are made up of more proteins. So many different, two different kinds of symmetries and more complicated uh, protein assemblies. And of course, this uh, virus attaches to the host cell. And uh, the in many phages, the the tail contracts and it injects the DNA from the head uh, into the cell. The DNA is packed at very high pressure in these heads. And as soon as uh, the base plate pokes a hole into the bacterium, the DNA shoots out uh, into the cell. 
this is a, a look at the 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 spike at the bottom of the base plate that actually in, inserts into the bacterial membrane and pokes a hole in it. And that spike, here's the structure of the spike, which was solved uh, a number of years ago. It looks just like a spike, doesn't it? It's tapered and it's made up of three monomers of the same protein. You know, at the top, they're, they're beta strands forming beta sheets to give it strength. And then they become random coils at the bottom where the spike is. And the three of these are held together by uh, an iron ion that's bound to the, the amino acids. But, you know, this is what pokes into the bacterial cell to make a hole in it and let the DNA come out and uh, inject into the cell. So it's a beautiful structure that completely follows the, the function of, of this spike. Herpes simplex is even bigger, and it has an unusual feature in that it has a hole in it for entry and exit of DNA. So the herpes simplex virus particle is enveloped, and the envelope, of course, is full of glycoproteins. But within it is a capsid that contains DNA. So we call that a nucleocapsid because it's an icosahedral structure. It's a protein shell with DNA in it. So it's a substructure within the envelope. So it's a nucleocapsid, as you can see here. Uh, but I want to point out to you, this capsid is made by a icosahedral symmetry, and it has five and five and three and twofold axes. It has pentamers and hexamers because it's big. And here's an example of, of a pentamer in the bottom here. But it has a portal. Here's, here's an um, electron micrograph of the portal. And here is the 3D reconstruction of the portal. So this is a hole at one five-fold axis of the virus particle. It's a portal where we think DNA goes in when the particle is being built, and it comes out when the virus is infecting another cell. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how those two activities are regulated, but it's unusual because it's just one portal. It's not at every five-fold axis, and how that happens, we don't know. And of course, uh, when this uh, virus has to infect the cell, the portal has to be in the right orientation as well. So it's another example of, in a more complicated virus, specialized structures. I have these uh, herpes viruses as a keychain. In fact, people have given me many of these over the years. And <laughs> here, here it is. That's the herpes virus. And you can open it up and you can see the nucleocapsid inside the icosahedral shell. And there's actually a portal which is different from all the other uh, five-fold axes. And you can, you can open up the um, icosahedral capsid as well, and you can see the DNA inside. <laughs> this is the ultimate nerdiness, right? I think this is very cool. This is a company that makes this, make others as well. Now, you can put membranes around uh, a viral mat matryoshka. Yeah, I guess so, right? It is. Is that Boutique Academia? Yeah, okay. They have phages too. They have a herpes with an antibody that you can stick on it. Oh, there's all kinds of cool virus stuff out there. Earrings, necklaces, good stuff. Um, capsids can be covered by membranes, right? Either helical or icosahedral can have a membrane around it. We call these envelope virus particles. And the envelope, of course, is derived from the host cell because viral genomes do not encode lipid synthetic machinery. These envelopes are acquired by budding through a cellular membrane. And here we show budding at the plasma membrane. We see a, a capsid being assembled and budding out. But this can, uh, <laughs> this can be um, the nuclear membrane. It could be the ER membrane. Uh, but it's always virus-specific. So as you'll see, herpes initially buds from the nuclear membrane and other viruses, coronaviruses, but into the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. And again, the um, nucleocapsids can have helical or icosahedral symmetry. The nucleocapsids inside this envelope, they come in both flavors. And let's talk a little bit about glycoproteins. These membranes, of course, are, have viral proteins in them, viral glycoproteins. And uh, here's influenza virus to illustrate that. It has two main glycoproteins in it, hemagglutinin, the purple one, and then neuraminidase. And we'll talk about their function later. But these are integral membrane proteins shown here schematically. We have a, a bilayer 
with an exterior part of the protein and a transmembrane part, and then a part that would be in the interior of the cell or the virus particle. And that part is important for assembly. Now, these proteins are typically oligomeric. They're typically trimers. And when they were first seen in the electron microscope, here's an EM of influenza virus, um, they looked like spikes. So that's what they're called. And that's now everybody in the world knows spike, right? Because all the vaccines are based on SARS-CoV-2 spike. Um, and that's what a spike is. In the EM, it looks like a spike. And, and you can see that clearly in the influenza virus picture. But they're, they're actually trimers of uh, individual glycoproteins. And we'll, we'll explore their functions quite a bit uh, in this course. These glycoproteins can be perpendicular to the membrane. So here's the influenza virus hemagglutinin or HA. We're going to encounter this often uh, in this course. It's perpendicular to the membrane. It's a trimer of three polypeptides, three identical polypeptide chains. Um, and you can see that reflected in the schematic. But some viruses, the glycoproteins, are actually lying flat on the surface. They're still bound to the membrane by a transmembrane segment. But here, the, the flavivirus E glycoprotein lies parallel to the membrane. And consequently, we, we draw it that way in our schematics. We draw it flat. And in the, in the reconstructions of the virus particles, you can see they're flat on the surface. So this is an um, envelope virus, this flavivirus. It could be it's Zika virus, actually. And it's envelope, but the proteins, the glycoproteins are still ordered icosahedrally. Look, there's a five-fold axis with five copies of the protein around it. There are three-fold axes and two-fold axes. So these proteins are inherently ordered, even though below it is not a capsid. It's, it's, these are embedded in a membrane. So here we have a summary of helical versus icosahedral nucleocapsids. Again, influenza virus, Ebola virus, they're enveloped. Within it is the RNA protein complex arranged in a helical structure. And that is called the nucleocapsid, RNA protein, RNA protein. You know, Ebola, it's one RNA, very long, but they're both structured similarly, RNA protein complexes. And then we have viruses that are enveloped that have icosahedral nucleocapsids within them. I showed you herpes virus, uh, which is enveloped. Within it is the nucleocapsid, the structure with DNA in it. Uh, or toga viruses like rubella virus, these have an envelope. Within the envelope is an icosahedral nucleocapsid. This has, an, in this case, RNA in it. And then, of course, we have our complex particles, which get short shrift because we really don't understand how they're built. And they range from pox viruses where there, there are, there's a membrane around it, but then the interior of the particle is packed with proteins, the double-stranded DNA exists in a circumvent a structure in the middle of the particle that's uh, covered with more protein. Uh, and we, this is not really arranged in any kind of symmetry. Same with Pandora virus and, and pithoviruses. They're not symmetric. They're very big, and they have multiple components besides membranes and internal proteins and nucleic acids. You know, the, I've showed you the, the pores of the Pandora virus and the cork uh, of the pithoviruses before. So that's why we call them complex because there's no symmetry involved and they can get very big. There are other components uh, that make up virus particles besides the structural proteins, the envelope, the glycoproteins that I've talked about. Many viruses have enzymes in the particle. This is a retrovirus. To illustrate that, it has reverse transcriptase, it has integrase, it has protease, and other proteins as well. Other viruses have different kinds of enzymes, capping enzymes, topoisomerases. There may be other proteins that act as activators of transcription, proteins involved in mRNA degradation. Even mRNAs can be, uh, cellular mRNAs can be packaged uh, into virus particles. And then in addition, there are other cellular components. So, so far, mostly viral components, but cellular components can be incorporated into particles like the histones of SV40, uh, tRNAs, lipids, cyclophilin A, many, many more. So 
you know, we've mostly focused on the structural components that actually are responsible for the architecture of the particle, whether it's helical or icosahedral, enveloped, complex. But there are many other proteins as well. We can we can consider them structural proteins because they're part of the virus particle, and they have a whole range of activities which we'll certainly uh, be talking about uh, in future lectures. Okay, so that's that's how we build virus particles. Uh, an overview of the three different kinds. Next time we're going to talk about attachment and entry. How these particles attach to cell receptors on the plasma membrane of the cell, how they get into the cell, and how they release their genome. Really important process, of course, because that is how you initiate an infection. <laughs>